Welcome to episode 82 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Eric Bork. He's a writer and producer. His credits include a couple of HBO shows like Band of Brothers. We talk about his career, how he got started, and how he eventually got on to writing and producing the shows that he worked on. So stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread the word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. A couple of quick notes. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts. And then just look for episode number 82. If you want my free guide, how to sell a screenplay in five weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional log line and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Just want to mention two things that I'm doing at Selling Your Screenplay to help screenwriters get their scripts into the hands of producers and sell their screenplays. First, we've created a monthly newsletter that will be sent directly to producers. Every member of SYS Select can submit one logline per newsletter. I went and emailed my large database of producers and asked them if they would like to receive this monthly newsletter of pitches. So far, we have about 120 producers who have signed up to receive it. These producers are hungry for material and happy to read scripts from new writers. So if you want to participate in this pitch newsletter and get your script into the hands of lots of producers, sign up at Selling Your screenplay.com slash select and secondly we're now fielding leads from producers for screenwriters we're doing a lot of outreach to try and bring in requests from producers for screenwriters last week we had more than 10 paid screenwriting leads these are producers and production companies who are actively looking to buy material or are looking to hire a screenwriter for a specific project if you sign up with SIS select you'll get these emailed directly to you several times per week here are a couple real examples from last week's leads we had a British company looking for emotionally charged limited location short scripts they have a budget of 350 pounds which is a decent amount of money to be paid to a writer for a short screenplay we had a New York production company looking for scripts in any genre they're about to begin production on their latest feature film and now they're trying to get their next project in motion we had a production company looking for screenwriters who were fluent in Swahili obviously this isn't everyone in fact it probably no one listened to this podcast but this is a good example of the sort of very specific leads that come in to us while this lead may not be for you, there are often very specific needs which a producer is looking to fill. And the great thing about these very specific leads, sure, you can't respond to them all. In fact, you can't respond to most of them. But when you can respond to them, your chances of actually landing a gig are quite high. My guess is this producer will be lucky to get one or two responses if any and that's only if he really spends that spends time getting this lead out to other services as i said i don't think i have any writers in selling a screenplay that speaks swahili but he'll go about putting this lead on other services and getting that getting word out there that he's looking for this and my guess is you know if he's lucky he'll get one or two responses so if you're one of those one or two writers who respond, your chances of getting this gig are incredibly high. It's not a lead where this guy's going to get 500 responses and you got to sift through every writer. If you actually can fill this lead, your chances of getting a paid writing gig are very, very good. So that's the whole point of these leads is, yeah, they sound very specific and they might say, well, who could ever respond to that? But eventually there's going to be some special skill or some special experience that you have that will be applicable to one of these leads and that's what you really want to look like because then that lead pool really shrinks down I've seen leads you know people that played specific sports people that you know have lived in a specific area of the country people that have you know some specific knowledge on a historical fact or ex historical character and those types of leads as I said if you can finally fill them there's not going to be a lot of people responding so those will be perfect and we get those types of leads this Swahili lead I would say is a kind of an extreme example of that 
Anyway, this is just a small smattering of the leads from last week. A lot of these leads are still very much active. So if you join SYS Select now, you can still submit to them. And of course, we'll be bringing you more new leads in the coming weeks as well. So to sign up, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash select. A quick few words about what I'm working on. I mentioned my mob action thriller a few weeks ago. I'm slowly starting to get some responses on that. So far, I haven't had a producer step forward and want to option or buy it, but I have gotten some good feedback on it. Some people have definitely seemed to have liked it. I got my blacklist reviews back. My first review was a four, which is a pretty abysmal score. And the reader just thought it was absolute garbage. He just basically trashed the script in the notes. But the second review, I paid, I uploaded the script and bought two reviews. So the second review was an eight, which is actually a very, very good score on the blacklist. It's an eight out of 10 scale. And, and I've never gotten a score as high as an eight on any of my other scripts. So I got a four here and an eight here. And the reviewers seemed to really get it. He mentioned a lot of similar Similar films, which I thought the film was sort of in the same vein as similar tone, kind of, uh, you know, actiony, thrillery with a little bit of comedy. Um, so I was pretty encouraged by this, that he really seemed to get it and seemed to understand what I was going for. I also I sort of take this as a good sign. It's sort of what I talked about a couple of weeks ago on this script with my writer's group. A lot of people in the group didn't get the material, but there was a few people that really did seem to get it. And I think that's what you need with a script. You don't want a bunch of people to read something and be lukewarm or even somewhat positive on something. You want just to find a few people that really, really, really like it because that person that really, really likes it, that's going to be the person who's going to push this thing and get it into production. So with a score of a four and an eight, it actually gives me an average of a six, obviously, um, which was enough to put me into some of their top lists, like the top uploaded scripts for the week, the top uploaded scripts for the month. So I'm hopeful that I'll start to get some downloads. So far, no one has downloaded though, so we'll see. Um, I'm going to keep the script up. I probably will keep it up for another month just to kind of see what happens. I think it's $25 a month, so I'll probably just spend the $25, go for an extra month. It took almost three weeks to get these reviews done. Um, I, once I uploaded the script and bought the reviews, I think it took two or three weeks to get these reviews done. So my month is almost up, but I'll probably run it for another month. So I, I'm starting to lose faith a little bit in the blacklist. Um, the other scripts I've uploaded have not made it onto the top list. So I always thought, well, gee, I guess that's the problem. Um, you just got to get on the top list and then maybe you'll get some downloads. It seems like it's very hard. So, you know, I've uploaded a bunch of scripts. It seems like it's very hard to get a high score on the blacklist, which is understandable. I mean, you got to find those readers that respond to material and stuff. So you want some real vetting going on. But um, now I'm not really so sure because now, as I said, this thing has made the blacklist. It hasn't had any downloads. Um, I think I got my second review on Thursday last week. Um, so now it's been five days, zero downloads. As I said, I'm going to let it run for a month, but um, I'm just not really sure how much value the blacklist really has especially considering the notes. I mean, if you've ever uploaded a script to the blacklist, you'll, you'll see the notes are, are pretty useless. Um, but even if you make, even if you get a good score, it just doesn't seem like it really does anything. So, you know, if you're not getting good notes, you're getting a good score and it still doesn't get any downloads. I'm just not sure what the value of the service is. So anyways, I'm going to let it run. I'll definitely report back. We'll let it go. As I said, I'll push it into the next month and just see how many downloads this ends up getting. Um, so that's pretty much it for what I'm working on. Now let's get into the next, the main segment of the show. Today I'm interviewing Eric Bork. Here is the interview. Welcome, Eric, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. My pleasure. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. So to start out, I wonder if you can give us a quick overview of your career and take us as far back as, as you want and kind of just tell us how you got into the um, entertainment industry and bring us up to maybe like that first script sale. Yeah. And then we'll kind of dig into the to the actual sales after that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I didn't necessarily know I wanted to do this growing up. But about the time that I entered college, I kind of knew I wanted to I wanted to be like a writer or maybe a musician or something in the arts. I studied a few different things, but eventually landed on a film production degree which I got a bachelor's degree in motion picture production in Ohio, where I grew up. Um, and uh, that led me to kind of realize that screenwriting or maybe being a writer director was really where I wanted to go. Because in film school, at least in my film school, you learn cinematography and editing and all these other things as well. There wasn't a really big focus on writing. There was maybe one screenwriting course. But after that, I kind of decided that's what I want to do. And eventually after kind of researching it a bit, 
it kind of became clear that living in Los Angeles was probably the, the right step for me. This is back in like the early 90s. So I moved to L.A. Uh, in 91 with the intention of working as an assistant in the industry as my day job, which I kind of had learned that people do and it allows them to to network eventually, but also just to be around people who you want to be doing professionally. And, you know, you learn by osmosis and it starts to become more real. Your mind. I think one thing with screenwriting is it's such a sort of swing for the fences, unlikely career to ever succeed at, that anything that helps you make it in your mind seem more possible almost, more approachable, is helpful. And for me, a kid from Ohio where no one was trying to do this, it just seemed like a total pipe dream. Working around that, I felt was going to be a good thing for me. Um, and it ended up being true. Uh, I started temping. Uh, just being a temporary secretarial assistant at one of the studios, I was kind of lucky to get in there just based on like my typing speed and my kind of secretarial resume <laughs> kind of thing, you know, uh, mm. at 20th Century Fox. Uh, and I got assigned to a lot of different temp uh, office jobs around the studio, many of them in corporate departments that I had no real interest in. But eventually I got to work on a TV show as a writer's assistant, which I kind of got because I had the inside track already being at the studio as a temp in all these different departments. I started to get the lay of the land kind of thing. And I managed to get an interview and get a job on this show, Picket Fences, which was a David E. Kelly drama that won the Emmy for drama series. That was its first year. And I worked for the other writer that wasn't David Kelly on that show as, as a kind of you know writer's assistant. And that was great. First experience in TV. Um, started to understand that TV writing was something that was you know a very legitimate uh, you know opportunity and that there's more opportunity really in that than there is in feature writing in, in Los Angeles. And that's still true. Um, so um, I was writing spec features on the side, and it would take me a long time to finish one, and no one would be interested in it once I did. You know, I wrote two or three. They were kind of like romantic comedy type scripts. Uh, but eventually I decided to uh, try my hand at television, uh, and I thought of myself as more of a half-hour comedy guy. I still do, actually, although my credits sort of point the opposite way, which we can get into. Uh, so, I, so I took a class at UCLA Extension, and I took a few classes there, but I took one specifically on sitcom writing. Uh, and now I teach there, by the way, so it's kind of come full circle, but I teach an online class on true stories there. But the class I took on sitcom writing, that was back in the day when you would write a sample episode of an existing show if you wanted to get into TV writing. You would never write an original pilot, hardly ever. Now that's really flipped where people write original pilots as writing samples for staffing much more. Uh, so I, anyway, I wrote a Frasier script in that class, or at least I began one and I finished it after the class was over. And, um, and eventually I gave that script to, um, a friend who was also an aspiring writer who'd been an assistant with me on picket fences who had just signed with her first agent. And she liked the Frasier and was willing to show it to her agent. Of course, that's a tried and true way to get an agent or a manager is, you know, someone who has one or knows one and is willing to personally recommend you. And that's, you know, one of the benefits of that networking thing, working in the business, is I met people like that. And because we're peers, you share contacts, you share information, you share help with each other. If you try and go to somebody way above you and say, will you help me, and you have nothing to offer them, a lot of times that falls flat. But anyway, this worked out. The agent liked the script and then wanted to know if I had anything original. And I had my latest feature that no one cared about. She read that and she liked it enough to sign me. Not enough to send the Fraser script out right away, though. She wanted me to rewrite it and give me a bunch of notes. So then that began a process where she worked with me much like a manager would today, uh, where they're really hands-on, reading multiple drafts of outlines, uh, uh, multiple drafts of the script, giving lots of detailed notes, until eventually there was a draft that we were both happy with, and then she would send it out and have me immediately start on my next one. So in about a year and a half, I wrote a Frasier, a Friends, and a Mad About You, which were all, of course, on the air at that time, all on NBC. They might have all been on Thursday nights even. Uh, anyway, those were the shows that I liked and chose to write. Um, and I was getting better and better with each one, and she was sort of trying to get me meetings. And she got me like one meeting at a production company that had another show on the air that might have other shows get picked up, and they might need writers, and they might consider me. You know, it was all very tentative. <laughs> Uh, but in the meantime, my day job situation changed drastically. Um, after Picket Fences uh, first season, I didn't go back there because the guy I worked for wasn't going back. So I was kind of back in the temp pool again where the human resources department at Fox would just assign me to where there was a vacancy. It could be anywhere in the studio. But at a certain point, I guess I'd paid my dues enough and the temp supervisor liked me that she gave me what was a pretty plum assignment as a temp, which was to go work at Tom Hanks's production company, which had just relocated from Disney to Fox 
with a new two year deal. And it was really he was starting over. He just had him and his assistant. Um, and that was really the company. There was no they weren't really producing anything. It was more just, you know, an office. And as he would say, a place to make free long distance calls. You know, <laughs> like uh, it wasn't you know, it was like going to eventually become something. But at the time it, it wasn't. And I was just a temp brought in to help them get the office set up. Basically, somebody who knew the studio had worked there as an assistant for two years, knew my way around. Uh, because, you know, at a studio, there's all these things to set up an office where, you know, you're ordering, you know, you're ordering furniture from this department and office supplies from that department. You're getting pictures framed in this other department. It's like this little city that you sort of figure out how to operate things. Um, but eventually I met Tom. Uh, for a long time, he didn't come in the office and, you know, I, he didn't know who I was. But eventually I met him and eventually turned into a full time position. Uh, and he knew I was an aspiring writer. Uh, but, you know, in those kind of jobs, you don't want to try to get your boss to help your career. You just put your head down and be the best assistant you can. So I w did that for like two years. And during that time is when he won his back to back Oscars. So it was a really cool time to work there. I mean, he was the biggest movie star in the world, arguably, with uh, Philadelphia and Forrest Gump. Um, and uh, I was writing these scripts on the side, you know, or sometimes even at work if the things were slow, but certainly like an hour a day every day, I'd be writing these these half hour comedy scripts. And eventually his assistant, who was above me, recommended or suggested or something that I should you know, give Tom my friends or my Frasier script and he might get a kick out of reading that, which was cool. I mean, I wouldn't be the one to ask that, but because she asked it, it was it was very kosher. And so he did. And I, I guess it's that. I mean, she probably knew I was writing features before that. It's not as big of a deal to ask someone to read a friend's spec than an original mm -hmm. feature. You know what I mean? Like, it's not as big of an imposition in a way because it's, you know, characters you know and like and hopefully it's funny and it's really short and you don't have to say, I question your whole premise. You know, <laughs> you can just say, hey, I thought Ross sounded like Ross or whatever, <laughs> you know. But anyway, he he was more enthusiastic than that. He said... He thought I was going to be a big TV writer someday based on reading those, uh, you know, so it was definitely a, hey, kid, you've got talent kind of moment, which was cool. Uh, but I still thought that that was just going to be my day job. It wasn't going to turn into anything else because uh, it didn't seem like there was any way for it to turn into anything else. But eventually he called me to his office for what I call my big break. This was like 20 years ago this month. Uh, Apollo 13 had just been a hit and he. Uh, and I'm in the credits as assistant to Mr. Hanks, by the way. That's the only movie that you can see me in the credits as an assistant. Um, he had pitched this idea for a miniseries to HBO that became From the Earth to the Moon, which was 12 one-hour episodes dramatizing all the other Apollo missions that weren't exciting, like Apollo 13, <laughs> that we would have to find story or someone would have to find stories for and turn these into dramatic hours of television. And HBO was spending a lot of money on this. It was their first big, like, historical miniseries. Now he, they've done a lot of those with him, but that was the first one. And he gave me this incredible promotion, basically, to help him kind of figure out what each of the episodes should be about, uh, kind of sort of outline a Bible for the whole thing. Uh, and so I worked with him and, and to create that document. And then that eventually led to and I was also tasked with helping these other producers that were on board to find writers to write the scripts for the other episodes for all the episodes. So I was, you know, reading writing samples like a, you know, development executive or something. It was sort of like a junior development kind of job, basically, at his company. I was no longer an assistant. I had an assistant. It was really a cool revolution in my life. But eventually that led to somebody suggesting I should write one of the episodes myself. Again, it wasn't me asking, but somebody else suggested it. So Tom was okay with that. HBO was okay with it. So I then wrote one of the scripts myself. Uh, it was very bad for a long time, many, many drafts until I finally kind of figured it out with the help of a mentor named Tony Toe, who was the person that was brought on to really be the day to day producer, co-executive producer of the series, non-writing producer, um, really helped me kind of find my voice and figure out how to make the most of this opportunity Tom had given me, Tom and HBO. So, um, Eventually, my script became one of the like scripts that people thought was working OK. And I got asked to rewrite some of the other scripts as we headed toward production. Uh, and then I got to just be a junior producer, basically, on the whole thing. I ended up with a co-producer credit, but I got to be kind of the, part of that inner circle, very much the junior member of it, of course, through you know choosing directors and casting and being on the set and being in the editing room. It was just like a crash course in producing and also writing something that's in production and rewriting things as they're being made and all that kind of stuff. So that was like a three year odyssey and, you know, it ended up winning the Emmy and the Golden Globe and all the big awards that year for miniseries, which I got to share in because I had that producer co-producer title. So there were like 10 of us that got to accept, you know, the award. Um, 
And so that's really what started my career. And then the other, the thing I'm best known for is Band of Brothers, which was a couple years after that, kind of embarked on a similar like three year process with some of the same writers and producers and directors and some new different ones, most notably Steven Spielberg, executive produced that with Tom for HBO. And I, and I again, like wrote on multiple episodes and was a kind of creative producer, you know, involved on the whole thing. Um, and those two credits are what really, you know, launched me because both of them won all the big awards. And, uh, and then, then I got to the point where I was sort of marketable as a writer beyond just working on things with Tom and HBO, which there were other projects as well that didn't get produced, quite a few that I worked on for his company, which later became Playtone and, and has produced a lot of things since then. But those are the two that, that got made. Uh, and then I went off and worked on staff on some other drama series, and I wrote some features on assignments, some through him, some not through Tom, uh, and then eventually started pitching ideas for drama series and writing pilots for original series. So a lot of varied things since then, but that's kind of where it all started. Perfect, perfect. I mean, that's very clear. I think that's an excellent, um, an excellent description. Um, I want to just touch on a couple things that you mentioned. Like you talk about this um, job as an assistant, and you said you knew that that would would potentially get you, um, you know, into the room with some 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 good people that you would want to be in the room with. So, how exactly? Like I understand doing temp work and you know just doing a good job at that temp work so that you get the better jobs. But maybe you can sort of elaborate on exactly how you got that first assistant job. Um, um, to to that writer of of picket fences because that's um, there's a lot of people that do temp work that never are able to land those plum assignments so maybe you can speak to that a little bit and it, it's actually an excellent tip when I first got to L A I sort of messed around as well and someone finally suggested hey you should do some temp work and um, it was kind of a revelation so that's definitely something there's extra work and there's temp work um, so that's an excellent tip for people that just and I assume it still goes on oh, yeah. um, in much in much the same way so that's an excellent tip for people but maybe you can just elaborate on a little bit how did you get that that actual job as the assistant yeah. to, the, to the writer on picket fences uh, well first of all for people that are interested there are all there are these certain temp agencies that service the entertainment industry and if you just google temp agency los angeles entertainment you'll immediately get like that first page will be pretty much all those places and anybody i think this has been a while now but i think anybody can pretty much apply to one of these and nobody cares that you went to film school or that you want to be a screenwriter right they just care will you be a good assistant you know you're going to answer the phone and you're going to be on a computer and you're going to you know, be presentable and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but once you're in and you're, I, I worked on a long-term temp assignment um, in Fox Home Video International Distribution when I first got there. I wasn't even an assistant. I was like a file clerk basically for a long time, but that was a good sort of starting point. After I'd done that for a while though, I realized this could just turn into a permanent job and I really want to get into production and development and be around people, you know, making movies and television. So I kind of asked to be put back into the, just the, the, the temp pool at large, which means I could be assigned for one day, two days, a week, two weeks, whatever, anywhere they needed somebody. And a lot of those assignments were not in places I really enjoyed being or wanted to be, but some of them were. And, and one of them was, um, I worked in the business affairs department for the television studio uh, assisting like for a few days or a couple of weeks, like some of the really top executives at the studio who are the ones making deals on all the new shows for all the writers and everything. And so that's that one assignment is where I really learned just by being an assistant on the desk, what shows Fox, well, 20th television, which is the studio side uh, of the, you know, they have the Fox network, but the studio would produce shows that weren't necessarily going on their own network. And Picket Fences was one of them. I think it was on ABC, but it was produced by 20th television. And so that was one of the shows that I knew was getting picked up. You start to realize that, oh, in May is when the upfronts happen and they announce the shows for the fall schedule, all the networks do. And this still goes on, although cable networks have sometimes their own calendars. But it's still the bulk of TV production is those upfronts in May you hear about. And you know all those shows are now going to start hiring writers and hiring assistants. So I kind of figured that out just by working at the studio and working in different offices and places where I started to understand how it all worked. And I would, like, read the trades, you know, like – Hollywood, Hollywood Reporter and Variety, which would come to the office every day, no matter what office you were in, they pretty much always subscribe to the daily trades. Um, and so I just identified that Picket Fences was a show that was picked up and they were going to be hiring some assistants. Uh, and so there was a process they had at Fox that, believe it or not, it was like a union secretarial position that I was in as a temp. You're part of a union, a secretarial union. And I think they had a deal at Fox that 
people that were already in that union at that studio would get like the right of first sort of opportunity to apply for other jobs at the studio. I think technically that picket fences job was in terms of how the personnel department would categorize it. It wasn't really a status change for me. It was more like a longer term temp assignment in a way. Like, I don't know that I even got an increase in, in income from that. It was more just, Hey, this nine month long job, which could be shorter, right? Cause shows get canceled all the time. Uh, is there, but you do have to interview for it, unlike most temp positions. So I just figured out what the application process was by kind of being an insider there at the company, and I just applied. And I actually interviewed for another job for a different producer on the show, non-writing producer, which I didn't get, and I'm glad that I didn't because working for a writer was obviously the better the better fit for me. So that I think that answers that. Yeah, 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 no, it definitely does. So I'm curious too. You talk about this this sort of first break where Tom calls you into the office and then you're working with him. It's, maybe you can describe exactly what that process was like. I'm I'm curious. It's like you know, so you'd come in in the morning and you and Tom would just sit in a room. There's a whiteboard. You're spitballing ideas. Were you going home, coming up with ideas, and just maybe walk us through yeah. that actual process? Well, as I recall, we had the rights to the the book uh, Man on the Moon by Andrew Chaikin, which was the became you know became the credited source material for the miniseries. It was sort of like a new approach to telling the story of all the Apollo a astronauts and those Apollo missions. So I read that book and it was kind of like, yeah, on my own time, I would go off and read the chapters and come up with my own like notes and ideas. And I remember Tom and I met for a series of breakfast meetings at restaurants or maybe sometimes at the office or at the studio over the course of, I don't know, a few months. And yeah, I think I would come in with ideas and he'd have ideas and I would write it all down and go off and then try to type it up into some kind of coherent format for him to read. And it was just kind of like these like, like little three page pitches for each episode. But first it was kind of finding what the take is on the episode because you couldn't just make every episode be whoever the commanding astronaut of that flight was, was always going to be the main character. It was always going to be about is the flight going to land on the moon or not? Like that would get boring and they all they pretty much all did without a hitch except for Apollo 13, which had already been done very well by Ron Howard and Tom. So, so it was, some of them was like, well, maybe this one should be from the point of view of the guys that work on the pad, the launch pad, or this one should be about, um, uh, what's another example of one that wasn't, this one should be about this astronaut who was like, really had no business being on a crew that was going to the moon. Cause he was like the new guy, but it would be from his point of view, which is like an interesting perspective, you know? Um, and, uh, so eventually the ideas sort of formulated for, you know, what the take would be. And those might change later, but they they coalesce enough for for us to for, for me to type up this like 50 page document that went to HBO and that they liked. And then we could give that to to any to the agencies. And it was mainly CAA because that was Tom's agency it was like their package, you know, uh, to send out to writers so that they would understand. Here's the different episodes they're doing. So you can come in and meet and talk about which one you might be most interested in if they like your stuff enough to want to meet with you kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you also mentioned that you had a number of other projects um, that did not make it to production. And I think it's important for people to realize it's always good to hear and sort of people see the successes and that they don't realize that one success, it might take 10 failures to get to that one success. So maybe you can tell us just what were some of those other projects and, and how many of these other projects were there that you work on? Cause anybody who's been in this business, it's like, there's so many false starts. There's so many scripts that get optioned, but never produced. And, and people don't realize that yeah. outside the business cause they only see the stuff that's finished and they don't realize that there's just dozens, if not hundreds of projects that just fall by the wayside. Yeah. I mean, I think if you wrote the story, of a screenwriter as a movie and you were trying to document what it's really like for someone who does get in the business professionally but has like the typical experience it would be you know their first few scripts that go anywhere just get optioned but not sold then they sell one but it doesn't get made or they sell another one and it gets made but they get kicked off and fired and it gets rewritten by somebody else but then eventually in the third act of the movie there's finally a movie that gets made that not only or a tv series not only did it get produced but they were a producer on it and it went on to win the Emmy award and they got to win an Emmy award. That's like how mine started. Most people like that would be the thing you would hope to get to eventually after many of those false starts. I've had the false starts more after that really auspicious beginning. <laughs> so I kind of went in the opposite direction. I mean, it's, it's all up and down from project to project, but basically, you know, th those band of brothers from the earth to the moon were like at the beginnings of my career. And those were like gigantic successes where I was like in a position of, 
like power and authority and whatever. Uh, and then after that, I've had I had all the ones that, you know, didn't get produced, but got sold or got optioned or I got hired. But then the show got canceled and all those kind of things. So as far as the ones that happened in those early days, though, the first one after From the Earth to the Moon was a mini series about the Apple computer company that was Tony Toe's project, who I mentioned was the guy that kind of was my mentor. And I did a lot of stuff with him, with him and or with Tom in those early days. Um, and he eventually, Tom got, came on board as an executive producer of that, where I wrote a couple of one hour scripts for HBO, of what was going to be a six hour mini series, but they ended up, and they liked the scripts. And the first one became a writing sample for me that helped me get a lot of work beyond that, but it never got made because there was a competing project about Apple versus Microsoft on another cable network that was further along and was going into production. So that was at least the reason that they told me is why HBO decided not to move forward. Um, there were a couple, there was a. There are a couple of other like mini series projects like with Playtime. Well, there's one that I can think of where it was based on a book and it wasn't historical. It was a fiction book, more comedic, which appealed to me a lot um, and, because I always wanted to be a comedy person and thought of myself as that. But the industry really didn't. After those credits, they thought I was like mm -hmm. this hard nosed, you know, guns and men fighting battles kind of writer, you know. So um there was a there was a feature uh, there was a oh, so there was a comedic miniseries that a few of us were commissioned to write scripts for that never got made. There was a movie for HBO that was my idea, a true story about a, a horse racing movie about this jockey that I pitched and that Tony was going to produce that they paid me to write and I wrote the script and got paid and everything, but that never got made. Um, uh, what else? There, there have been others. I, I rewrote, I did a rewrite of the movie The Great Escape for TNT, like a new sort of configuration of The Great Escape, which was a true story that didn't get made. And um, and then, you know, there have been a lot of pilots. That's been the main thing is I've had several, like four or five different pitches for shows that I sold the pitch and, and then wrote the script and it didn't get made. Or I didn't quite write the script. I started to write the script and then they decided, no, let's do something else instead. And it all kind of petered in the end, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so there have been a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a minute about your agent. One question I always get, and um, I'll let you basically answer this question. But one question I always get, like, so you're basically at, at Tom Hanks Production Company. Now you're starting to get work as a writer through completely through your own, you know, initiative and means. And um, how did this, you know, play out with your agent? People always ask, well, do you still got to pay your agent, even though you're the one getting the work? And, um, you know, it's I don't think people fully comprehend how little agents do in terms of getting you work and that it's kind of expected that you're out there beating the bush and getting your work and it's expected they're still going to get their 10 percent. so maybe yeah. you can speak to that a little bit what was your relationship like with your agent as you're moving along yeah. in these early well, stages the, i was i was still with my original agent which was from a, a very a smaller but legit agency uh, when i was doing from the earth to the moon and i mean they absolutely got a commission and she even told me you know probably the first thing you'll get professionally will be from someone you know because you're like an assistant to tom hanks and meeting a lot of people than anything that i do for you but you also have to understand that she spent all this time working for free, giving me notes on all these sitcom scripts. We went through three different scripts with all these rounds of notes on outlines and drafts. And then she did talk me up and send them out and all that. So I didn't begrudge at all her getting a commission on the money I made on From the Earth to the Moon, which was not huge money anyway for someone's first project. Then during From the Earth to the Moon, she left the business and I decided to switch agencies. At that point, CAA was 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 more accessible to me because I was working with them because they were sort of on this project, you know. And I ended up signing with CAA and been with them ever since. And uh, uh, and obviously, they've taken commissions on everything. But they actually have been instrumental in me getting a lot of work. Certainly, there are things there. Those projects that were with like Tom Hanks and or Tony Toe, I did kind of set those up on my own. But they would be there to like negotiate the deal. You know, but then later when I started working on staff of other series or pitching ideas for series, they were really instrumental in getting me all those meetings and talking me up. And I would not have been able to pitch any shows to any networks without them. So I don't really begrudge the uh, commission. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a bit about um, hiring writers. Um, there's a lot of TV writers out there who listen to this. And, you know, as someone who's been on the hiring side of of, of 
you know, producing TV. Maybe you can give us some tips. Um, just talk about what you see, some, maybe some common problems that you see writers make. Um, and, and ultimately, how did you find most of these writers? Did they have to be represented? Did you ever take like just spec scripts from writers that weren't represented? And, and just maybe take us through that process. Well, the two times I was on the hiring side were, were these two miniseries, which I have to say are a little bit of a different animal than a normal TV series, right? I was never a showrunner on a, on a regular, you know, network TV series. I was one of the writers and producers on these unique HBO hybrid true story adaptation limited series. So it's a little bit of a different animal. We weren't hiring, you know, the normal kind of writing staff that would sit in a writer's room where you have the staff writer level writers and then the other higher level writers. And, you know, they're going to get promoted every season and you hope in success you're going to go five, six, seven seasons and people have back end points and all that kind of stuff. None of that existed. Right. So I worked on some shows that were like that as a like producer level writer, but wasn't hiring people. On the ones where I was involved somewhat in the hiring process, these were mostly writers who were more from the feature world and the TV world for these miniseries. Most of them had written true stories or period pieces or things that just felt like they were sort of somewhat in the vein of what we were trying to do. Um, and they all had agents. In fact, most of them were with CAA because CAA was like the feeder agency giving us all these writing samples. They weren't all. Some of them came to us because, you know, one of the executives at HBO or one of the other producers on the project, like from Imagine, who was involved in From the Earth to the Moon, they knew a bunch of writers, obviously, and they would have an idea for a writer. But these were not like A-list feature film or TV writers. They were more like sort of middle class writers for the most part, the ones we ended up having on not to offend anyone, because some of them were beyond that, actually, now that I think about it. But in case they ever hear this, well, I mean, Graham Yost was one of them. Graham Yost, who had done Speed and Broken Arrow and now Justified and a lot of other things. Uh, he was he was probably the most prominent writer that came on board from the Earth to the Moon and then later did Band of Brothers as well. Um, so they came from different stories, but they absolutely were all represented. They all had agents. And I think that's the normal process. You know, if you tr want to work in TV, the first barrier is you have to get representation and nowadays that usually means a manager first and then an agent second and you pretty much can't do anything until you have both of those i mean there might be some exceptions to that certainly some people that have agents and not managers less likely if you have a manager and not an agent you're going to get a staff job but you know it's a long process getting get your representatives have to go through hell to get a writer even considered for their first job on staff of a series like it's a big job for the agency let alone for you as a writer, introducing you around town and why should this writer be perceived above all the other people competing for this tiny number of jobs on staff of shows. So, I mean, there might be a period where you're red hot. Because, like when I came off of Band of Brothers, I was like really hot and I got offers to work on several different shows in one season, drama series, which is apparently kind of unheard of. I didn't know at the time that, well, it's not unheard of, but for someone who's brand new, it's pretty un, un, unusual. You know, if you have a really great writing sample and it really hits the right person who likes it the right way, I guess the process can be pretty easy. But even then, that's going to probably happen because your agent gets it to them. And it's even more likely to happen if your agent is with the same agency as the showrunner, because then they're going to have that person's ear more. So, um, I mean, that's the that's the process as I see it. I don't as far as speaking to mistakes and stuff, I think the mistake people tend to make is just thinking the process should be shorter and easier than it is and thinking that you can circumvent everything, you know, circumvent getting a manager or an agent and just get your material directly to the right person and that will work. And people tend to think that agents and managers and even, you know, producers and executives are like in the way of them getting their work made like those people don't serve a purpose. And instead, I should just have my work be made right away. Uh, and that it's not legitimate that those people are hard to get to or hard to please or are critiquing my work or in between me and the jobs. From a writer's point of view, it doesn't. It feels like you wish they weren't. And believe me, I feel that way about my own agent because they're the hardest one to please sometimes. And you need them before anything's going to get out there to producers. Like if you have a pitch for a show, if he doesn't like the pitch, it's not going anywhere. So that can be aggravating. However, I do think that they serve a legitimate purpose and. Uh, it's very unlikely that something that was not able to get an agent or manager is going to get sold or produced. In my opinion, at least at least on the scale of, on the kind of projects that I've worked on, which are kind of mainstream studio network projects, I can't speak to the kind of like lower budget, uh, you know, kind of non writers guild, you know, sides of the industry that I don't really have personal experience with. But from my experience, it's like agents and managers are kind of like a necessary part of it, even though they drive you crazy. And the process of getting one and working with one can drive you crazy. But I don't see a, an easy way around it. So I think, you know, I just say accept that and 
understand that it's probably a long road to get your material and your writing to the place where you can get anywhere with it with a representative or with an actual studio buyer, network, or producer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, no, all good points. So let's talk about some of these pitches. Um, again, I get a lot of people, um, and I'd be curious to hear your idea. Let's maybe first start out. You can just kind of talk us about how these pitches came about, how you got these meetings and ultimately sold it. I get a lot of people coming to me through my blog. Hey, I've got this brilliant idea for a TV show. How can I sell the idea? Oh, by the way, I'm not a screenwriter. I don't have any, uh, any desire to write this up into a, into a screenplay. I just want to sell this brilliant idea. Um, so maybe we can start with some of your, your real life examples and then kind of um, go to to advice for these people. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you you wish that that would work and it seems like it would work, but the reality is an idea generally isn't going to go anywhere unless it's actually written into a script by a writer and a good script. Uh, And, of course, also people think their ideas are great, and then if you ask an actual producer if they read them, they would say, here's why it isn't great, and there's often a big disconnect between that those two sides of it. But for me, it was like after Band of Brothers, my agents at CAA were like, you know, we can get you meetings to pitch ideas. So come up with some ideas for shows already. <laughs> so they sent me out on some just like general meetings with production companies who had deals at studios, TV studios, um, who were CAA clients because that's the way the business works. They keep you with their people generally. Um, just to meet meet them and talk about the kind of stuff I've done, what it was like working on Band of Brothers, what they're looking for, et cetera. And then after I had a few of those meetings, it was like, okay, come up with ideas. So I started coming up with ideas for one-hour series, and I would just send like a three-sentence idea over email to my agents, like a log line for a TV series. I would send many of these. This was their advice. Just send us a couple sentences, and we'll tell you if we think it has promise. So I did many, many, many of those, most of which they shot down. Sometimes I went in and pitched them to my agent in their offices, and they would shoot them down. Or they would say, well, maybe interesting, but, I mean, these guys, they see hundreds of pitches every year, and they talk to the networks every day, and they know what's selling and what isn't and why. And so even though they're not writers and they're very much more sales guys and girls, they know what will and won't have potential. They understand. They, get, they develop the critical faculty to be able to evaluate whether an idea has potential or not. So I'd have to get it past them, but eventually there would be an idea that they would like. Um, and they would say, this is a good one. We want you to go meet with this production company who you maybe already had a general meeting with and they liked you and pitch it to them. So develop those three sentences into like a 10, 15 minute pitch. Now you're only ever going to get to pitch things like that if you're already established in the industry. Even if you have an agent, but you've never like worked on a show or worked professionally, you're probably not going to ever get to pitch something to a network. You might write the pilot on spec and your agent then will send it out to people to read. But even then, it's very unlikely that from an unknown writer that the show is going to get sold. But that show could be a writing sample to help you get a job on staff somewhere. But anyway, I just started going through that gauntlet and I would I would, you know, come up with the 10, 15 minute verbal pitch from the idea my agents sort of validated. I would pitch it at the production company if they liked it then the next meeting is at their studio. If they liked it, then the next meeting is at the network. And if the network likes it, you've got a deal and you get paid to write the pilot. Um, So for every one of those that I sold, there were probably 20 or 30 or 100 that at some point in that process fell apart and didn't advance, essentially. Mm -hmm. But I I was only even able to have the right to go pitch these things to networks because I had these credits and Emmys and I was suddenly somebody from Band of Brothers And from the earth to the moon. And also I had writing samples. You know, my agents would send, you know, one of the Band of Brothers scripts plus the Apple script that I mentioned. And people like the samples. So the credits and the samples and the awards and the agent push, big agency push combined helps open doors. And then hopefully your ideas are ideas that they want and want to pay you to write. Mm-hmm. And let's get a little clarification. You said you created like at the very bottom of this sort of funnel, you created just many, many, many pitches and your agent would reject them. Give us some rough idea. Are we talking 100, 500, 1,000? I mean, what was like a number? I mean, I would say over the course, because there were several years where I was really doing that full time. And that was like all I was doing was coming up with ideas for shows. And I wasn't working on staff of a show. I was just developing, which means you come with ideas. And if you sell one, that's your income for a year. And it's a decent income. If you sell zero, you have no income. So it's a tenuous way to make a living. But uh, um, I would say probably 100 ideas maybe that I noodled with and worked on at least for a half hour or so, maybe much more than that, for like the one or two that were actually, hey, let's go pitch this to networks or whatever. Um, just a very rough estimate. I don't think it was a thousand, but probably over the course of the career, maybe maybe 
I don't know, 100, 200 ideas total for the handful of ones that actually I got paid ultimately to like write a script for or got a script that I wrote optioned. So that's kind of the next level. So then you have a handful, you've got two or 300 of these pitches and then uh, that, so then a handful, let's say five or six, your agents like, and then how many of them actually turn into meetings? What percentage actually go to that next step and then ultimately sales? Well, if the agents, just, I mean, it's just, yeah, if the agents like it, you're definitely going to a meeting with a production company. I mean, almost always. It's very rare that an agent likes it enough. In my experience with my agent, who was very tough on ideas, if at CAA, if he didn't like, if he liked it enough, he would get some production company to want to hear it pretty much always. Uh, I don't think there was ever one where we couldn't get a single meeting, but he believed in it. Uh, there were some he believed in marginally that we didn't get that many meetings for. Others he believed in a lot that we got a lot of meetings for. A lot depended on his level of passion for it. But once you're pitching to a production company, you're way past, you know, you, you've, you've made a huge hurdle. Um, so like if the agent likes it, it's got a shot. And probably, I would say, the ones my agent liked, I would normally get a production company that also liked it enough to go pitch it at a studio. Then it might die. Or the studio likes it, but then it dies at the network level. I also had some where I um, was, didn't even go directly through the agent, but maybe had a general meeting with a producer. And we started talking about an idea sort of outside the agent and just, you know, they liked it and we just sort of ran with it. And, and uh, um, But I would say... Once the agent liked it, I would say maybe one out of three, you would actually end up selling that idea to network and the others you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. You would sort of lose it somewhere. The real hurdle was getting the agent to like it in the first place. And some agents yeah, aren't as hard as my agent necessarily was. Some of them may not be as experienced in TV. Some of them might be just throwing every idea a client brings them against the wall to see what sticks. But my agents were the opposite of that. They didn't put their name on something unless they 100% thought this could be a hit show. Mm -hmm. And you seem very at ease with this process. Um, I can see, well, I can see it being incredibly frustrating. There must have been some ideas in this, this, you know, several hundred ideas that you thought, you know what, this is a really good idea. And your agent just out of hand, you know, said, nah, this is never going to work. Um, how did you deal with that kind of, and, you know, back to the drawing board, even there, there must have been some ideas in there that you really did believe in that your agent just wouldn't get on board with. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh it's a frustrating process when you're in the middle of it, no question about it. But it's the nature of the screenwriting game, no matter what version of it you're doing, is that you're always getting rejected, you're always getting notes, people are never loving your stuff as much as you loved it. And I, I'm the kind of writer that gets easily talked out of my own ideas or easily gets convinced that what I thought was good isn't now that I've heard someone else's perspective. Like some writers err on the side of like they won't change anything. Others err on the opposite side, which is more like me. And you're looking for a sweet spot where you're like, you believe in your stuff, but you're also open to, you know, feedback. Uh, so I wouldn't say there were too many that they would that they would say no to that. I was like, damn it. I know this could be a hit show because I, I do feel like they kind of know more than I do in a way like I can write it and I can give it life and do a lot of things that they can't do. Give it comedy and everything else. But I the whole the business of selling ideas it's all about concept, even in the TV world. It's all about that two or three sentence idea that's fresh and original. Like my agents would never say like, this is bad. What they would say is it doesn't have a hook. It's hard to sell or the hook is too similar to other things. Um, and so it may be executed really well and be a great show, but it's hard for us to sell it without something that you could say in a couple sentences. And this is the fresh idea. And I would tend to have ideas that I thought an execution would be good, but didn't have that perfect hook. It's very much like features where you're looking for that high concept thing that in a sentence people go, that's a movie. Have I never seen that movie? I want to know what happens in that movie. Like you hook them really easily with a concept. That's always the goal and not easy to do. Yeah, yeah. Is this still the same process? Like is in television um, – a, a hot writer comes off a show and that's kind of, you know, he gets his chance to go through a couple of years of this. That's still sort of the same process now. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's talk about your website a little bit. You got a lot of great content. Um, you can mention the URL and then you can kind of maybe, um, just tell us a little bit about what you're offering on your oh, website. Sure, yeah. The website it's called, it's, well, my blog is called flying wrestler. So it's just flyingwrestler.com, which if you go to it, it'll have a little explanation for why I gave it that quirky name. But basically, I started blogging about five or six years ago and started doing, started being asked to speak at writers' groups, started being asked to teach. 
Uh, and so I uh, started being asked to read scripts from people I would meet at like, you know, writers conventions, like the screenwriting expo I spoke at and stuff like that. So I started doing one on one consulting as well as teaching. So like I teach at National University in their MFA screenwriting program, which is which is online, basically almost all online. I teach for UCLA Extension. I've done webinars for the writer's store. And then I just have my own website through which people book me for consulting. So I kind of juggle my time between my own project that I'm writing and kind of helping other writers. So just flying wrestler. And there's a um, I have this thing I give out called the 10 that I came up with called the 10 key principles successful writers understand. And if you go to the website, you can click on that and enter your email address and you'll get those sent to you. And I also have some uh, the recent thing I've done is I've created some audio classes that are five half hour audios that you can download from the website, which are just I, I find in reading scripts. And I, even though I have a lot of TV experience, I still read mostly features as a consultant. And I've really and, I've, and I'm still writing features. And over the years, I've just noticed that there were so many common things, common notes that I have on scripts like the same issues that crop up again and again. Even in my own scripts, I'm challenged with them too, that eventually I kind of, it's almost like when I give notes on a script, I, there's like a hundred different notes that are in the universe and you're just applying those same hundred notes to every script in different configurations because it always comes down to some, some very fundamental things. So I created these audios, which are just like kind of my downloadable talking about each of these five topics and just kind of hitting on what, over the years, I've accumulated as my belief as here's what you need to know about story concept is one of them. Main character is one of them. And then I have one on each of the three acts, X1, X2 and X3. Mm -hmm. um, so because I just I just feel like if you really, really understand the principles and can apply them to your work, you can you know, you can move forward quickly in this. But the disconnect comes with either not knowing all the principles or knowing them, but not having an objective way to measure how well you're applying them, which is why, you know, people have their scripts read by others. But it's uh, for most people, it seems to be a mysterious process of trying to move forward. And why am I not moving forward as much as I would like to? And I've gone through it myself as well. So, um, you know, I, I've I've been obsessed over the years with screenwriting, you know, paradigms and books and classes and trying to anything that I could use to help me understand and get better. So I'm kind of always learning. And now I'm starting to actually give some of my own accumulated and synthesized thoughts on that stuff to other writers. Mm -hmm. OK, that's all sounds great. I will collect all those URLs and I'll put them in the show notes. So people listening to this, they can just click over and um, and find those. Um, are you on Twitter? Maybe you can mention your Twitter handle Twitter. Too, in case people want to follow. Yeah, it's also Flying Wrestler at Flying Wrestler on Twitter. OK, yeah. perfect. Perfect, perfect. So I'll link to that. Well, Eric, you've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate you coming on and talking with you. Very interesting episode. My pleasure, Ashley. Thanks so much for having me. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation of your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the one who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, including concept, characters, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We provide analysis on feature and television scripts, and we also do proofreading, so if you don't want an analysis but would like someone to proofread your script, we now offer that too. We are rolling out some additional options. We now have the ability, you now have the ability to upload a short script. We have a reduced price, obviously, for a short film script. We also are now reviewing treatments where you can upload a a five or ten page treatment and our reviewers will basically give you the same analysis but instead of on a script they'll give it on a treatment this can be very helpful if you're vetting your ideas you can write it up into a five page treatment get some very um, inexpensive professional feedback to see if that idea maybe is worth pursuing and pushing into a feature film so we're unrolling that service this week as well and we're also going to um, start having a service where you can send us a script and our readers will write a log line and synopsis for you. This is not a service I personally would recommend. I really think that the 
writer is the person who should write the log line and write the synopsis. I get a lot of people saying, oh, I'm not good at writing log and synopsis. If you're a writer, man, you got to learn to write. I get so many requests for this service, though. I thought, well, I'll throw it up there, and and people can use it. the The readers that were that I'm working with, they're they're very good at this, and they're they're more than happy to to offer this as a service. But again, I think you're better off just taking the time writing your logline, writing your synopsis. But if it's something you want, we now offer that as well. As a bonus, if your script gets a recommend from a reader, you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts. This is the exact same blast service I use myself to promote my own scripts, and it's the same same service I sell on the website. It's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking for material. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com dot com slash consultants. In the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Alan Trezra. He wrote a film called Burying the X, which was directed by Joe Dante. We get into some real good detail about how he got his career started and how he got this film produced. It's a really great example of how a writer becomes a producer and really carries this project over the finish line. I mentioned this interview a couple of weeks ago, and it just got backed up because their VOD release. We're going to try and time the interview release to the VOD release of the film but it's definitely going to go next week. So keep an eye out for that episode. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Eric. The big takeaway from me on today's show is the very straightforward path that Eric took. It's not quick. It's not an easy path. You heard it from him. It takes many years. It took him a bunch of years of, you know, doing low level temp work, but eventually he got into a position where he could get his work seen and start getting paid to write. I did a blog post a few weeks ago. I'll link to it in the show notes where I went through every podcast interview that I had done and wrote down how each screenwriter broke into the business. The overwhelming majority of people broke into the business through networking, which included working in the business. There are a lot of other things people used query letters, cold calling, contests, etc. But most screenwriters broke into the business exactly the way Eric just described it. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think this is your best real chance of becoming a professional screenwriter is following the path that Eric just described. It could vary a little bit. Eric took temp work. Maybe you know someone who knows someone who can get you a job in the mailroom at CAA. I mean, there's different ways to get those entry level jobs, but that's sort of the gist of networking is starting in an entry level job, working your way up, networking, meeting people, knowing people in the industry. And it's not just the networking that 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 is valuable. It's seeing how projects, seeing how sort of the 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 projects get made, seeing which projects get made and why they get made and talking to just being at lunch with people who are a little higher in the food chain than you and them explaining, well this project got made because of this. And just being around that environment will really help you tailor your scripts, your ideas, your concepts concepts to concepts that can possibly get made. So it's more than just the networking. I believe it's more than just the physical networking of knowing a lot of people. It's there's a certain just knowledge that you gain by having these jobs and being around the business and seeing what really happens and what it really takes to get projects made. Again, this is going to take years. It's not going to be quick. You're not going to be creating your own TV shows in three years. If you're lucky, you might be writing on a show, or or if you're you know a little less lucky, you might be a writer's assistant on a show. And then hopefully down the road, you can have enough experience and clout to actually get out there and start pitching your own show ideas. Again, listen to this interview. Eric started out in the early '90s. Band of Brothers wasn't until the late '90s, early 2000s. So we're talking about like a decade. You know, there's almost a 10-year span where you start out and slowly work towards your thing and and you work towards your goal and it's it's again it's not a simple easy it's not a it's not a it's not a fast path but i do think it's probably the most clear concise path for screenwriters now i know this path isn't for everyone it wasn't for me i was terrible with these sorts of entry level jobs and so that didn't exactly reflect well on me and certainly no one would ever have hired me as a writer you know, when I couldn't even do a good job getting them coffee. So you should be honest with yourself and really decide if this is for you or not. Everyone's situation is different. And, and again, these entry level jobs, moving to Hollywood and taking an entry level job is not necessarily for everyone. Again, this does seem like the clearest, highest odds way of breaking in as a screenwriter. So if you're in a position to get out there and try and make this work, I would recommend it. But if you're not, there are other paths. And again, I would highly advise you to check out the blog post I just talked about. 
in which I tallied up how screenwriters broke into the business. So you can perhaps find a path that is more suited to your skills and your situation. Read the post and just look at all the different ways. I think there's maybe five or six different ways that people broke in, consistently broke in to the business. Again, networking was by far the best, but there is other ways. And so you just have to look at what are the ways people are breaking into the business and then think about your own talents, think about your own situation, think about your own skills, your personality, and try and find a, a method and a channel that's going to work best for you. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.